Till then they were building a B2C concierge service powered by a manual chat agent. Hello and welcome everyone uh, to the next episode of the Analytics India Magazine podcast. Uh, today we have with us a very interesting guest. Uh, he is the ex-co-founder and CEO of Nikki.ai. Uh, hi Sachin, how are you? I'm good. Thank, thanks for having me here. Great. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, I think this is going to be a very interesting conversation. Uh, so uh, let's start from the beginning, right? Uh, we are talking about Nikki.ai. Uh, what was your thought process? Uh, you know, I, I don't think there was any chatbot that existed in 2015, uh, uh, but data science was big. Uh, what was your thought process? Uh, how did the idea come to mind? And right. So this is uh, when I was when we were running uh, when I when I was running the previous company, Innovacer. Uh, we used to work a lot on on NLP, on natural language processing, and uh, some of the projects included mining through millions of blogs and then trying to find patterns. And I realized that the technology has matured and it can be used for multiple applications. And I think it was during that time uh, when I was talking to one of the, uh, um, I, I just was, a, was on a US trip and I was talking to someone and he mentioned that, can I integrate uh, uh, my SMS engine with the Domino's Pass so that I can directly place an order? I was like, yeah, you can do that. And you can also uh, make it, make a machine that can understand human language. Mm and can build a concierge service places that. And that was the birth, that was actually the birth of, of Nikki. That um, we were like, for a typical business, can they use, uh, use, the, use the ability to understand human language to, to, to create new experiences for the customer? Yeah, it's funny how all entrepreneurs are startups, right? They're always looking for inspiration and this is some kind of incident, some kind of a talk or a chat with someone and then you yeah. suddenly this thing. Uh, it's great to know that. Uh, NLP, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you said uh, at that time you were al al already working in NLP. So I'm assuming this is 2012, 13, 14. Correct. Right? Uh, NLP is still today hard to crack, uh, yes. right? Why is that? We also talk about in, in a lot of ways that, you know, the language is a passive generative and then there's intuitive and we have not reached that intuitive stage where, you know, let's say an, a language or a bot is able to understand sarcasm, for yeah. instance, right? Yeah. Why, what is it, why is it so hard? Uh, and secondly, will we reach that stage where uh, a bot might uh, understand sarcasm? Um, right now, it is far away, okay? Um, and I'll, I'm saying that because uh, even for humans, it is tough to understand sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> you, you talk to Sheldon and he does not, right? And uh, I think uh, broadly speaking, uh, it is, if you look at applications of, of, uh, of NLP, uh, part of the reason this is tough is because you, you need to figure, you, you need to build enough domain depth, right? For example, if, if someone is building an NLP for banking, it requires a lot of data around what people say when it comes to banking queries, okay. right? So that is one aspect of it. And uh, unless you build a hundred million corpus, you'll not be able to, to do a good enough job of responding to new customer requests. And, and, and this is just for a very specific, very niche, um, uh, very, very niche query, which is just completely object oriented, right? Me meaning that uh, I can only answer banking queries. But the moment you ask a teller, how is your day today? There is a human intelligence around it. And to answer a question like, how is your day today? It, he needs to think, he needs to be sentient, right? That kind of ability is not there in a chatbot today. So even if it can answer general queries, it can't answer very, very specific queries such as this. And that is, so that is always going to be complicated. To understand sarcasm is always going to be complicated because there's a lot of ambiguity uh, when someone, whether or not someone is actually sarcastic. There's a lot of emotional uh, component to it. Uh, there's a lot of, in the, lot of things in the body language, a lot of context behind why someone has made a joke, which is, uh, which is hard to understand by just language, which is hard to understand by just that text. Yeah, that's true. But uh, then, uh Will we ever reach that stage? And what would it take to do that? I'm hopeful that we will reach that stage. Um, it it will probably be some time away though, uh, because you know, f for a machine to understand all the variances of a human uh, emotion, 
it needs to have a lot more data than just the text query it needs to have emotional signals hmm. it needs to have all the past interactions right and hmm. and um, unless we create that data warehouse i don't think we'll get there okay fair so enough. that means that probably as customers we will have to adopt to a world where we are okay with machines capturing every signals that we are generating as humans yeah yeah so that's that's about nlp right uh, understanding the natural language uh, processing and the applications let's talk a little bit about the startup culture mm-hmm. in india right we are now investing uh, so we in bangalore especially we have uh, seen or not just bangalore even in uh, delhi and cr we are seeing there's a lot of uh, funding that is available mm-hmm. and the culture has really bloomed in the past uh, couple of years but there are so many entrepreneurs uh and when you go to uh, a vc so my question is when you go to a vc funding how do you convince them what is it what is it you need to have within your pitch deck uh, that will help them understand that you know uh, you are worth investing and is it just about the pitch or the idea or is there something more yeah there is a lot more i think after 10 years of entrepreneurship i have seen the complete end of the spectrum okay um so one one specific thing that i've seen is that just um technology alone is not going to cut it right which is what most founders most engineers especially look at the world that way ki ek bahut badhiya technology bana diya and chal jana chahiye i'll become a unicorn but it doesn't work that way you need to think about the market dynamics you need to think about the moat the competition how how will you be able to prevent yourself from that competition for example with nikki um we had built a um we had built a our own technology which was raw and new back then using understanding human language in vernacular languages right um and we had built a dynamic state machine that could actually retain the context of the conversation Now, all of this technology was new but the technology alone does not make you differentiated because it can be copied right the moment the market becomes big the moment technology uh, gains adoption or the moment it it picks up people start copying it and that that's exactly what happened uh, google and facebook they started copying this technology and then they opened it up for everyone and the kind of data muscles that they have they could actually gather a lot more uh, data and could make it a lot more mature so just technology is not going to cut it you have to think about uh, for example with nikki one of the things that we wanted to figure out is how do we build network effect so that even though we have built a technology but uh, because of the network we are able to defend it from the incoming competition right and and that is a question that you have to really blueprint before you go and jump into the execution of of a business right you have to really think about how do you build network um and and it could be different for a b2b business for example if if you are building a b2b business for you the question to answer is if you have cracked a client why will the client stick with you what is that added advantage that you are providing which the others won't be able to provide would it be that you will become so big and be able to generate uh, scale give give a pricing which a new newbie can't offer whatever that is you have to figure out what is that competitive moat and why you will win that is the core reason why we see invest yeah correct you i think you talk you made a very, make a very interesting point that you know as soon as the technology or let's say even an idea is out there are many big fish yeah. in the sea right they will eat you up very quickly yeah. Yeah. how do you fool proof it uh, when i'm when i'm coming out with an idea i'm going for a vc funding suddenly i get fame but suddenly uh, bigger companies realize right uh, that there is a big competition the 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 best uh, solution they have found it they just like acquire you yeah right or they just build something of their own and better because of the available resources how do you uh, how do you scale a startup in such an ecosystem then so you you have to think about moats you have to think about defensibility of the business for example defensibility defensibility what does that mean um yeah so so i'll give you an example um whatsapp became massive right um and uh it was a, it was a simple chat application but it was built using a technology which was uh, pretty future looking and when whatsapp was launched um facebook or google could have copied it very easily what they could not copy 
the technology they could have copied very easily. What they could not copy is the network that WhatsApp had. What does that mean? Uh, if I am on WhatsApp and Facebook tomorrow comes up and says, Ki, use Messenger, I'm not going to switch to Messenger because 10 of my friends are on WhatsApp. Hmm. And I'll have to get all of them to shift. And all of them, they'll have to get all of their friends to shift. It's a big, big, big switch. Which is why even if you're using Telegram, uh, even if you want to use Telegram, or you, there was a big uh, noise when WhatsApp started using your, uh, connecting your phone number with Facebook profiles, right? And then people were like, we'll switch to Telegram, we'll switch to Signal and whatnot. Did not happen. It's very tough to beat network effects. And uh, that is why customers did not shift. And that was, the, that was their holy grail, especially in internet businesses. They could build network effects. Similarly, if you're, if you're building a B2B business um, and say you, you build Slack, for you to shift from Slack to say some other messaging application, you will need the entire company to shift, right? And, and that is not easy. Uh, all, your, all, all the historical chats are there, all, all the files are there. It, it's just, it's, it's your, part of your life now, right? It's, and the, the more you integrate your life with the workflow of an app or, or a software, the tougher it gets to switch. Similarly, if let's say you've built a, um, um, if, if you've built a app that provides, if, built, if you built a bot for uh, banking for HDFC, right? HDFC has already configured its workflow completely on, on your bot. Unless you're doing something which is drastically, uh, which will, put them at risk, right? Or, or unless they find an alternative which is drastically different. For example, they get something for free and, and like instead of paying millions of dollars to you. So in such scenarios, it is usually very, very tough for a, a banking partner to switch to some other app, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so you can think about defensibilities in, in, in these aspects as to how, when the company has become big, assuming that capital problem is solved, which is what VCs will solve, assuming that is solved, once your company becomes big, Mm. How can you really, really defend it, defend the moat? Mm -hmm. So were you not able to defend Nikki.ai then? We were not. We, we, we figured that uh, we had a good technology, uh, we had good product, we had a great team working with us. Um, but the business that we had built, it was getting um, attacked by, from different areas, right? We had, we had, it was a consumer facing app that we eventually pivoted to and then we saw that geos and of the world started moving into our territory, and uh, we did not have a moat uh, because for any for any geo to launch, they just had to uh, integrate the technology and then uh, launch their own uh, vendor in in the so let's say if they had to launch uh, grocery in in a small town like Seeker, they just had to set up that partnership, right? And it was not that defensible. And at the end of the day, we could not fight against that competition. And you have to really build that blueprint of the business. That's fair. We win some, we learn some, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> but uh, then uh, when, do you, when do you know uh, when is the right time to pull the plug? Uh, one can just be very adamant, but probably as an entrepreneur, you are like, you know, maybe not, maybe, maybe I'll win the next battle, right? Yeah. When do you know uh, now is the time to pull the plug and maybe try something different? It's it's a tough question to answer, and there is really no. No, right I, 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 let me. I, I ask this because you know there's so much emotional investment. Absolutely. Right? Can absolutely. you imagine 2015 to 2021, six years of your life? Yeah. There was blood and sweat and everything that yeah. you gave, and suddenly this is not going to exist anymore. Yeah. That must be like. Yeah, I mean it was tough, and uh, our, for us the question was, uh, and and again like I said, there is no right or wrong answer to it. But for us, the question was whether we spend the next six years trying to figure it out or do we do use this time to do something else? Hmm. That is our thought process. And then there is another set of thought process. For example, Gapshap, what they did was when they were pushed to the boundary, uh, they were building, they were running a company called way to sms which was giving you free bulk SMS options. But then they pivoted to B2B SMS gateway and now they're a unicorn. So, and they spent the next eight to 10 years to, to make that pivot successful, hmm. right? So as an entrepreneur, you have to ask yourself the question, are you game? Do you see an opportunity to make few changes and, and really make that happen? And are you committed to make that change? Is your team committed to make that change? All of that question is what goes into uh, making a decision whether to pull the plug or not. You can always say that 
um, and, and some entrepreneurs say that I have grit, I will not give up. Some entrepreneurs say that I am smart, I know when to give up, right? And, and there is really a very, very fine line. Um, at the end of the day though, uh, it is not, the, the asset is not the company. The asset is the entrepreneur. And that asset can be rebuilt. Yeah, I don't think that, I don't think you're giving up. I think you're just choosing another challenge. You choose yeah. your battles, right? Yeah. yeah. So what is the what is the next uh, battle for you? What is what is cooking in your head? Uh, right now, though, I'm like I said, uh, I'm I'm just uh, enjoying. I'm chilling right now, enjoying my <laughs> holiday. Uh, that is probably what it is, and I mean it works till it works, and then uh, after some time, I'm I'm going to figure out what I want to do with the next innings. I think you're chilling, but you you have something. Uh, you're looking for inspiration somewhere. Right? I, you always always are. always an entrepreneur is always an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur is always an entrepreneur. On that note, uh, thank you so much, Sachin, for coming, thank, and thank, thank you, you for, for telling us the story of Nikki. Yeah. Good, great uh, being here and interacting with you. Thank you so much.